Tuesday, Damien Omen 2, a television premiere. Starring William Holden. Boy has got to die. And Lee Grant. The first time was only a warning. I had no idea I'd be covering the sequel to The Omen this soon, because there I was in the movie theater, and suddenly the trailer for an Omen prequel, The First Omen, popped up on screen. I don't know how that movie is going to turn out, but all I know is that it's far too soon after Exorcist Believer, so my guard is up. But in the tradition of Rambo First Blood Part 2 and Braddock Missing in Action 3, we got 1978's Damien the Omen 2. Why wouldn't there be a sequel to the 76 film? It was a colossal hit at the box office. However, the original movie's writer, David Seltzer, wasn't really interested in penning a sequel, but did state that if he had, he would have picked up right from the end of the first and explored Damien living with the president in the White House. Whereas here, we've got a preteen Damien, and the story is set seven years after. Series producer Harvey Bernhard came up with the story, while the screenwriters this time were Stanley Mann of Firestarter and Conan the Destroyer, and also Mike Hodges, who was originally to direct the film, but instead parted ways from the production, even though some scenes he shot were still in the film. Hodges of Get Carter and Flash Gordon was supposedly let go for artistic differences, with the producers stating that his method of directing was far too slow. However, Hodges stated that he left on his own, partly due to an intense set where a producer showed a gun during an argument. Instead, he was replaced by Don Taylor of The Island of Dr. Moreau and Escape from the Planet of the Apes, known for keeping movies under budget and turning them in on time. Some folks were happy to be on board the film. In the role of Damien's uncle Richard Thorne was William Holden, who had turned down the role of Robert Thorne in the first, but didn't want to turn the franchise down again. Plus, Lee Grant also jumped at the chance to co-star, given she was a huge fan of the first. But still, let's hope Ironside from Visiting Hours is not a huge fan of this, so he won't bother Lee on set or in the hospital. Don't you worry, though. Jerry Goldsmith is back to do the music again. with Snoopy playing backup instruments. Hurry, hurry, there's gotta be at least one actor from the original that's in this. Remember Leo McKern as archeologist Carl Bugenhagen? You should, he's the only actor to play the same role in more than one Omen movie. He's almost the Detective Perkins of the series. We know the movie will be shot well too, as this time they got Jaws's Bill Butler on board as DP. I know where he's going. He's not missing the return of Taco Bell's Nacho Fries this time. The opening sequence is only a week after the first one, meaning it's got to catch everyone up. Michael, have you seen this? Oh, uh, hey, it's Donna Mills' birthday today. No, you idiot, the headline. The same, what are you talking about? There is no doubt Damien Thorne is the Antichrist. You said the same thing about little Jeffy and Family Circus. Look at the lines in the pictures! They predict the future and the path of the Son of Satan! So he wants his friend Michael to deliver the news to Damien's new guardians that he is in fact the Antichrist. It's fine, we'll hide the information in a can of shaving cream if need be. The movie honestly starts out looking more like an Exorcist 2 than the actual Exorcist 2. It's also a better bird's tooth than the bird's two. Look, he's either keeping statues of Pazuzu or King Ghidorah in his underground lair. The art on the wall is all the evidence we need of Damien. Is him. My god, you're right. Danny Torrance must be destroyed at once. And don't show evidence that you can take down Satan in a room that can be barricaded and crushed in. At least build an emergency exit. I just want you to know, Carl, this is all completely your fault for bringing me into this. I was just sitting there enjoying my Sunday funnies, and now suddenly I'm on Beelzebub's shit list. Now is not the time for scripture. Or maybe it is. Or it is written in the book of Revelation. Then shall that witness be revealed. 
We get it. You do a kick in John Reese davies impression. Don't let that be the last thing we hear. It is. Meanwhile, in the orphanage the Blues Brothers grew up in, Damien is now 12 years old and has picked up a British accent that he's trying to hide while living with his uncle Richard and Richard's wife, Anne. Are we just never going to address why or how he got kicked out of the White House while living with the president? Aunt Marion, however, senses evil in Damien and sees him as a bad influence on his cousin, future innovator and CEO Lucas Donat. Whatever, they're being sent off to military school now. Tribulation wars and smoking cigarettes ain't nothing 50 push-ups can't fix. Hey, Murray, give us a cigarette, will you? Now, Damien, you know the answer to that one. If you don't ask, you never know. I kind of like that Damien is halfway into turning into the evil kid from Fat Man. But just think of how much evil would be thwarted if people just listened to Sylvia Sidney. They didn't listen to her about not saying Beetlejuice's name. And now they're ignoring her warnings of Damien being a little bastard. I do like the way she puts it when she says, Your brother tried killing Damien for a reason. It has to be because the day damn kid had it coming. Part of me wishes they would listen to her and then just send the kid off to live with Charles Grodin. They're also listening to this slideshow from Nicholas Pryor, warning them of the future they may hold in raising a child. There could be either shenanigans or drug parties. He was Tom Cruise's dad in Risky Business and Robert Downey Jr.'s dad in Less Than Zero. I don't know how Damien won't get away with it in this franchise. <laughs> Because whenever someone senses evil, the Jerry Goldsmith score kicks in and something shows up to either crush the threat or give them a fatal heart attack. Let's take a break. They'll be doing roll call for about 20 minutes. Then we'll get to Lance Henriksen whipping these kids into shape. Behold the son of Satan. He's one step away from the world's most important position. The Final Conflict. Rated R. We're back. If anyone can scare the devil out of these kids, it's Lance's Sergeant Neff. I've seen him take on Satan in a biblical version of Duel. Of course, he's very good in it, even though Henriksen didn't care much for the flick after, citing that it didn't do much for his career back then, and a lot of his scenes were cut. No matter, it's the first day with the boys out of the house. Richard's taking in a skin flick, then he's gonna order half the menu at Portillo's. Richard is an industrialist, and businessy, business, business, business. He's got to get through today's meeting before getting the bad news. I mean, I guess it's bad news. Finally, peaceful dinners from now on. They're going deep into the labs for a bit of privacy to confront Paul that the perm was a bad idea. Find a new barber. No one likes this look, Paul. So they want to control the entirety of the food and farming industry, or something, but that's gonna have to wait because of the tragedy, of course. Marion died in her sleep last night, a coronary. I'm sorry. I've got to go. Did anybody like Aunt Marion? Damien is portrayed by Jonathan Scott Taylor, who cites Carrie White as an influence on his Damien portrayal. Although he does make a lot of it his own, Damien has no problem at the beginning standing up to the bullies and is pretty threatening, yet cool about it. Even Mark Thorne can throw a punch. <laughs> Yes, yes, but he doesn't have the mean right hook that Damien has. In that he'll use the right hook of the other person to slam it into a wall. Now I can see a little bit of the Carrie influence if the movie started out with Carrie already handing the bullies their ass. Clearly, he doesn't know about the previous student who was kicked out by being inspired by Jennifer. Back to business. Eh, someone will take care of the funeral arrangements for Aunt Marion. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if her body was just still in the room. Let the maids take care of it once the smell gets to be a bit too much. Though someone else has to give Richard a warning of what's going on. Enter photojournalist Joan Hart. It's a pretty chilly Chicago afternoon. We'll take this in the car inside of the studio where we'll throw a rear projector in. 
She's kind of like the priest trying to warn Robert in the first, yet our hero doesn't listen. Put your strength in Christ! Only he can protect you! Please, you must listen to me! Again, if you were to act like a normal person and not a raving lunatic on the street corner, they might listen. Try again with the wife. Play it cool, play it cool. They might listen if I play it cool. And and don't say another word. Richard is absolutely furious Charles, about all this. Charles, you are in danger. God damn it, I already blew it. I'll go try the groundskeeper now. She may be trying to fool Satan by wearing a red dress, so he might think she's one of his brides. Eh, just walk onto the school grounds and ask which one Damien is. It's fine. Um, did she catch him cheating? I knew it! They're deflating the footballs! I must get to my bookie ASAP! With Damien on the team, their school is sure to win the championship! Gotta switch my bet at once! One thing that didn't return was the Rottweiler, who was Damien's spirit animal in the first film and in the third, but maybe he wanted too much money so they cast a raven instead. Or because it might have been easier to write in a raven during sequences like this than a dog. The eye pecking does give it a very Lucio Fulci feeling. They couldn't just stop at the bird killing her. No, no. Kick it up a notch. She'll be fine. Now we're looking at a side story of what happened to the kids who went off on the ski trip from the holdovers. Uh-oh, a birthday scene. <laughs> Don't worry, it's Mark's birthday, not Damien's. So there's only a 20% chance a maid will jump off the roof. There's other plots to get to. I'm really gratified to learn that you finally decided to shelve your land acquisition project. <laughs> Not sure I care all that much about the land investment plot line. But hey, one day it'll all be Damien's. You should know everything about the Thorn business. After all, it'll be yours one day. And Mark's. And Mark's, of course. Well, Mark's gonna have an unfortunate accident. Though the more Paul talks, I think he may be the Mrs. Baylock of the film, possibly? A boy's 13th birthday is considered by many as the beginning of puberty, of manhood. Or he's the creepy neighbor from It's Alive. William Holden is instantly regretting this. What the hell, Gregory Peck didn't have to ice skate with a bunch of damn kids? It's now time for people to be broken up by another death. I heard about your reporter friend. What's her name? Joan Hart. I'm so sorry. Yes. Does anybody like anyone in this story? Still, I think the master plan is for the Raven to show up to continue helping Damien cheat at sports. That's why he offed Joan. Please, please break the ice so I can use the clip I already have in my back pocket. Thank you. Here you go. The ice! He's gonna break! No, Bill is stuck under the ice! Someone help Bill! Also, who the hell is Bill? Oh, that's Bill. Why the hell was he playing on the ice anyway? It's clearly his time. He found a hole to escape out of, but still went back under and died anyway. Obviously, this was fate. For now, Paul is the new president of the company. It's official. Look, he's on the magazine cover. That finalizes the deal. Time for more meetings. What the hell is Bessarian doing in India? I needed a second opinion on our proposed land purchases there. Excellent. I was hoping there'd be a second opinion on their upcoming land deal. Paul is going to take care of all the problems they have with their new innovations. And, uh, oh right, the military school. I almost forgot Damien was in this movie, called Damien. His joking lands him in trouble, so he has to cite all of his knowledge of Napoleon in front of the class. How many men did he lose on the march to Moscow? 450,000, sir. You only know that because Ted Theodore Logan also got sent to this military school. This is actually a pretty good scene where he is quickly answering every single question about dates that the teacher is throwing at him, which appropriately is really weirding the guy out. Someone end this humiliation. Richard Third, Thorne. Come here. We've decided to make you the dean now. Or he's just in trouble. What were you trying to do? I was just answering questions, Sergeant. He was showing off. He was kicking ass is what he was doing. But behold the first of the twists. I just felt... The day will come when everyone will know who you are, but that day is not yet. 
Of course, Lance is involved with protecting the Antichrist. I should have known that the second he summoned Pumpkinhead. Anyway, guess it's raining outside. We'll have marching practice here in the halls. We're not disrupting the classes, are we? Even though he's nowhere in the scenes, I just know that somewhere Niedermeyer is among the students. Damien's given the advice to just skip to the end of the Bible. We killed the archaeologists, so you don't need to read about any of that grail or ark shit. He gets a little something from Robert, which is knowing exactly where the 666 is on his head. All of this stuff is interesting. They don't just jump to making Damien a cartoonishly evil kid. When he does something creepy near the beginning, he's confused about it instead of sadistic. And when he acts a little bratty, it's more just a spoil bratty kid thing. That makes his confusion about his destiny seem realistic and even a bit human. It's stuff like that I want to stay on. I don't know what this phone call will be to Richard Thorne. I just have the feeling that I don't care. Even if in the Windy City something is still spreading fear, look, the devil even put Saul in the hospital. Not that Saul was a threat, the devil was just being a dick. I guess they are tying the threads together momentarily, as whatever is going wrong at the Thorn Industries plant is the day the kids are visiting on a field trip. Oh, what, was the tour of the cardboard box plant already filled up? There's only a little bit of toxic chemicals around here. We are now about to enter a highly complex experimental area. A toxic chemicals, we hope, will one day feed the world's hungry. Oh sure, but when I wanted to see final processing at Silver Shamrock, I got turned away. Something terrible is gonna happen, isn't it? What's wrong? <laughs> But it's the other twist, a supervillain origin story. I had no idea this was going to end with Pizarian here fighting the Green Lantern. This had twice the budget of the first film, which means it really went Hollywood, as in Meshach Taylor's Hollywood. His role as the Doctor was his film debut. We'll be right back. Damien is the only one in the entire class not affected by the toxic fumes. You know what that means. Boil up some plutonium. We're going to be drinking good at the kegger tonight. Behind the sweet smile Get away from me. lies a dangerous secret. You think it's possible for a child to be born evil? <laughs> Omen 4, The Awakening, a movie special 9.30 next Saturday on TV2. We're back, and of course Damien has the same blood cells as a jackal. I knew Meshack would be an expert at science. Look, he has chemicals burning as he's researching. That means he's smart. Sadly, that also means he's gonna die somehow, or the devil will severely delay him by hitting every single button in the elevator. There's no middle ground with Satan here. He'll either give you a heart attack or drop you from an elevator. Meshack doesn't seem very concerned. He's remaining comfortably standing on the elevator floor. I think he can survive if he just jumps before it hits the ground. Ooh, falling 20 stories really hurts the funny bone. He'll also be fine. Might be slightly harder to walk away from being cut in half, though. Wow, that's sad about the doctor being cut in half. So anyway, what did Damien's blood test say? That's literally how the scene goes. <laughs> Let's pray nothing bad happens to Dr. Warren. Sure, he's been sent the sacred knives to kill Damien like we saw in the first, but more importantly, if he dies, no one will shed a tear because that's just what this universe is. They only get emotional when watching classic films like the 1957 Pat Boone movie April Love. Pat will not be happy the Antichrist is such a huge fan, though it lost Damien on the ending. At last, a happy ending for a change. Mm. Boy, you're too young to be so cynical. Damien's movie pick for the evening was Petey Wheatstraw. So Warren explains the daggers from Bugenhagen and that he could have been right about Damien the whole time. The tests show he was born of a jackal. This conversation could have been a phone call, but no. Best talk as loud as you can, where Mark is listening, and everyone is quick to believe the prophecy, except William Holden. They even double-check their Bibles. 
My God, in the book of Revelation, John did witness Napoleonic knowledge at a military school. I think he's starting to second-guess himself a little bit. I don't know, if so many people are trying to kill our nephew, maybe at the least he's a real dick. And he's extremely bad luck. Who dies from elevator wires? Mark is finding it best to keep his distance, not because he believes Damien's evil, more like he doesn't want to be cursed to die via birds and semi-trucks. We can't be friends anymore! What are you talking about? I've seen what you can do! Your father tried to kill you! They say he was crazy, but it was because he knew! Jeez, you could have just told me you didn't want to go to the Star Wars premiere. I do like Jonathan Scott Taylor in this. It's not a perfect performance, but he does get the important things down. Like seeming genuinely upset that he's losing his cousin, and then pretty naturally becoming more threatening as the scene goes on. He balances being disturbed and conflicted that he killed Mark by bringing the Force right to him instead. And are we sure Damien's evil? He's the only one who's actually sad that someone died. They did a good editing choice with this scene, too, where it's more impactful that the musical score isn't there and it's just silent. The movie as a whole, I think it's okay. It plays out like you'd think an Omen sequel would, in that it plays it pretty safe, unlike something like John Borman's Exorcist 2, and it also doesn't seem quickly assembled together like it's alive to. It is uneven, though. The stuff with Damien in the school is excellent, and it should have been way, way more focused on that, because that really progresses the character. Instead, we spend too much time on his guardians. William Holden is perfect casting for Robert Thorne's brother, but most of his sequences, like not believing Damien's evil, then investigating it, talking to various people who believe it, then they die, all of that just feels like it's repeating the Gregory Peck stuff from the first albeit with deaths continuing to be hilariously one-upped. <laughs> that makes David Warner's decapitation look like natural causes. This better not interrupt Damien's graduation. Look, he's already living like a king. Listen to the soundtrack. The 70s were so 70s that funky disco beats were even playing at a military school graduation. It does a few different things with the climax, a little. Yes, Richard wants to kill Damien with the daggers again, and yes, he's stopped. But there's not one, not two, but three possible Mrs. Baylocks. Anne will be rewarded greatly for her service to Damien. <laughs> Or not. Like I said, it's bigger budgeted, which means there had to be far more explosions in the climax. I guess Lance and Paul were still in on it? I don't know. The Paul stuff was kind of forgotten about as the movie went on. And you can tell a lot of Lance Henriksen scenes were cut, because this part where it seems like he's there to help Damien, well, that's the last conversation he has in the film. There was even a love interest for Damien that was cut from the script, which definitely should have been included and would have been way more interesting than the business stuff. I do like the ending shot, though, where he now seems pretty content on what his destiny is. That does make the movie a pretty good bridge from how we saw Damien in the first and the amazing Sam Neill performance in the third. The movie wasn't a bomb, but wasn't as big of a hit as the first. Reviews were mixed, but, I mean, they were mixed on the first one, too. Look, none of that matters, as long as it was successful enough for the final conflict in 1981. Thanks for watching, everyone. I don't say it enough, but subscribe to our channel today and click the notification bell to get alerts on new episodes, and we'll see you next time. My old man tells me the thorns make their own hats because the stores don't sell them large enough for their big heads.